Welcome to the Remarkable Dentist Podcast with me, Fred Joyle, where I interview amazing dental practice owners digging into their successes and failures, their insights and hindsights, getting their views on where dentistry is going, and discovering what it took for them to become remarkable. Welcome to the Remarkable Dentist Podcast. I'm Fred Joyle, of course, and I'm here with Dr. Ali Panapur, who is a holistic dentist. He's been doing this for 25 years. We're going to talk about what that means, how different that is than your standard issue dentistry, and all of the amazing things that he has been doing and learning over the years and, and the incredible success he's had with people who uh, have had all sorts of illnesses that many doctors couldn't fix. And he was able to change their lives and their health by uh, treating them with biological and biomimetic dentistry. We're gonna find out what biomimetic means. Uh, and so uh, Dr. Panapur, welcome to the podcast. It's such a pleasure and an honor to be on your podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Let's go back to the beginning a little bit. Um, how did you get into dentistry? I, it's in my blood, it's in my genes. Um, my brother is a dentist, my father is a dentist. I remember as a child, um, he would take me to his office and I would love to go with him where I would sit in the laboratory and just play with wax and create little teeth. And um, while other kids, I guess, were outside playing soccer and wrestling and what have you, I wanted to create, I wanted to watch him see patients. Um, as I got older, I would actually assist him in uh, different surgical protocols. And my father is an amazing uh, oral surgeon, a dental surgeon. And uh, it was just a passion of mine to see him at work. I, um, and that's where I kind of led me to dentistry. So, so how long, how young were you when he was letting you in chair side? Uh, oh, uh, I started assisting him at around age of 11. That's what I thought. Um, <laughs> that's what I thought you were going to say. Yeah. So no, no uh, problems with blood or anything like that. That uh, I, I, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm paranoid of engine grease. I have to be honest, <laughs> but I don't have any problems with blood and tissue and that sort of uh, protocols, but little bit of engine grease I, or just dirt, I lose my mind. <laughs> so you've come all, what hooked you into holistic dentistry? Give us the, the sense of how this started. And then we'll go into more definitions and stuff like that for, because we've got all kinds of dentists out there, very high end practitioners and, and guys are doing a lot of bread and butter dentistry. And, uh, I'm sure they've heard about this sort of stuff and maybe have taken some courses on it and, and maybe are keenly interested in it, but I don't think there's a lot of practitioners of it. Um, you know, having run 800 dentists for 35 years, we, we probably had maybe a dozen dentists who would call themselves truly holistic. A bunch of them would list it as, as, as something they did, but uh, I don't know what that meant. Um, you know, you know, um, I'm, I'm, as a young dentist, I, as a young man, and still to this point, I'm a very curious individual. And it was during my dental training that I was introduced to this more of drill it, fill it, build it type of dentistry. And I could not stand that. I, I, I frowned upon it because I kind of saw where in my life is going in a way that when I entered the clinic, I, the dentist who was graduating gave me all his files and I had to review all these files and take over all those patients. And I would say 95% of those files, what I saw was little filling became a bigger filling, became a bigger filling, became a crown, became a root canal, tooth got extracted, it was either a bridge or a partial denture. I saw this vicious continuous of this little protocol and I was really actually got really disappointed. So I started searching for more. I wanted more out of dentistry. 
And as my, God bless my grandfather used to say, the eyes cannot see what the mind doesn't know. So I took it upon myself to start taking a lot of different courses in dentistry. And that's where I found my way into these so-called holistic dental associations, American Academy of Biological Dental Medicine, IAOMT, and all these other sort of symposiums. Now, I have to be very honest with you. Yes, I do use some of these words in my SEO and search engines, but truly I have got to a point that I'm staying away from these words, holistic, biological, alternative, green. Um, at the end of the day, I wanna be known as the good dentist, the conscious dentist. Through my association and even lecturing at these symposiums, what I saw was that about 60, 70% of the material presented, there was good research behind it, peer reviewed papers. So I took that in. There was about 10, 15, 20% of bunch of hoo-ha, where when I asked for research, they were not be able to present it to me. So I kind of stayed away from those protocols. And that's really where my path began. And what I realized is that during my different lectures, a lot of these dentists take a weekend course. And then on Monday, they call themselves a biological dentist, a holistic dentist. And it all really starts with them removing mercury fillings. So what I don't understand is if you are placing rubber dams, if you are having a vacuum, uh, if, you're, if you're offering your patient oxygen support and protecting yourself, how is that making you a biological dentist? That's where my confusion came in. By law, every time we work on a tooth, we're supposed to put a rubber dam. That's why, you know, the ADA and California Dental Association. So taking it a little bit further are having a vacuum that will suck all that aerosol and mercury vapor that's coming out to our environment, other patients, me and my assistant, and then me and my assistant have mercury vapor mask. Again, I don't understand how that makes you a biological dentist. Um, so you see, that's where my questions ar arise. At the end right, of the that's day- a, They're removing, they're safely removing amalgams, basically, yeah. is, is so that all they're make, doing. That doesn't make you a biological dentist. You know, our no. researchers in, uh, such as uh, Dr. Uh, Richard Myron with PRFEDU and scientists behind him who are shifting these dental paradigm for us with research and new materials. I mean, those are our true biological dentists. You, you see yeah. where I'm coming from? So if okay. you're using yeah. three fillings- No, it's, much, it's much broader and it's almost not inclusive of just taking the metal out of somebody's mouth as they Correct. say. Correct. So. I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. You know, 1990s, they taught us at University of Pacific Dental School, which is a, was a great dental school. And I had a great experience within that school. Dr. Dugoni was our president. Uh, he was also the president of the ADA at that time, an amazing individual, a lot, of, a lot of respect for him. One of the things they taught us right away was that, for example, if you have a diabetic patient, make sure you, you take extra care of their gums because diabetic patients are prone to gum disease and periodontal disease. Okay, great. Now, 20 years later, what they're telling us is that, hmm, we're not sure if diabetes causes gum disease or gum disease causes diabetes. Yeah. Okay, so it really goes back to chronic issues, chronic inflammation. Another example, recent email that I received that patients with periodontal disease are at a higher risk of getting COVID. Again, yes, it's because of the periodontal disease, but periodontal disease is a chronic issue, chronic inflammation due to a chronic infection on our immune system. 
So my understanding, my philosophy, my protocol is tooth decay, gum disease, TMJ issues, craniosacral disharmony due to unbalanced bites, infected root canals, and let's be honest, all root canals are infected one way or another. This is not a quotation by me. This is by Dr. Cohen, who wrote the books Pathway to the Pulp, which is studied at all dental schools around America. And he, in his book, states that no root canal is completely sterile. And infection of old extraction sites due to so many reasons, all these issues have one thing in common, and they're all chronic issues on your immune system. So as a dentist, above and beyond me taking care of my patients, I'm always curious. For example, if you come to me and out of nowhere you have a tooth decay, of course, I want to remove that tooth decay as least invasive as possible with using possible laser, hand-driven motors, air abrasion. I want to make sure that I use a very, as clean as possible a biocompatible material. So I stay away from mercury and we can get into that later why. Again, there is no true material out there that's 100% biocompatible. Let's be honest about that. Sure. Um, so all materials have their ups and downs. So of course I wanna replace that tooth structure with the proper, as clean as possible material. But my question will always be, how did you get that tooth decay? What's going on? Is it your brushing? Is it your flossing? Is it your pH? Is it gut issues? What else is going on in your body that suddenly out of nowhere, you have this tooth decay? That is being a conscious dentist. And of course, as far as my dental license is concerned, I'm pretty restricted. I can't talk to patients about their GI health, but at least I can refer them to a GI specialist or to a medical doctor, integrative doctor, a, a naturopath to go further and find, find out what's going on within that host. So again, it's about stepping back and taking a look at the bigger picture. And that bigger picture is knowing your patient's blood type, knowing their diet, elimination, scars, really doing a thorough history of your patient as it, relates to, as it relates to their dental challenges. And of course now, with all these chronic issues, specifically Lyme, we are finding how dental health is so imperative for patients who are dealing with advanced chronic issues. Anywhere from Lyme to high blood pressure to uh, cardiovascular issues, lung issues, there's been direct link via research on all these chronic issues and dental challenges. And there's only so much that, uh, that you can really do about that if you're not examining that on, on the patient or if you're not, and, and some of it, you're, it's beyond your boundaries. So you're, you're integrating with other services or, or practitioners that are also helping you, but, but you've become, you're, diagnostic approach is different uh, significantly than I think would then than somebody getting a medical history on a patient and you know it's what are you allergic to what are you taking all of that you know surgeries you've had that is true <laughs> above and beyond I, I spend more time every day speaking with other physicians who are collaborating with me in reference to their patients. And by the time I finished with them, number one, they were never taught anything in dentistry in their medical school or, or, or the school that they attended. And that's pretty sad. They have not been trained in nutrition, food pharmacy, which is also sad. So raising their awareness through my phone conversations, through my lecture has been one of my passions within the past 10 years to raise their awareness of the importance of their dental health, making sure they add certain questions to their questionnaire about their 
patient's dental health. So with every patient, when they, when they come to me, I would say, again, 90% of my patients are getting fly into LA to see me. And number one thing we do, we always start with a cone beam scan, a three-dimensional image of their cranium, looking at their sinuses, looking at their TMJ joint, and specifically any infections in the jaw. If it's an old existing root canal, or if it's a tooth that was extracted improperly, and they have infections that are residing within these jaw bones. So, and of course, we send that scan to advanced radiologists who also will confirm what we're seeing. So that's really where, where I get started. And of course, these patients are dealing with number of different issues, anywhere from Parkinson's, um, my cardiovascular issues, as I mentioned before, chronic issues, They've been around the world from one doctor to another, spent over a hundred of thousands of dollars, and they're still sick. So, yeah. example, if you needing to go through chelation, detoxification, rejuvenation, that is impossible to do if you have active infections, such as infections in the jaw, or TMJ issues, which we all know TMJ issues also has a vicious ripple effect. It not only the muscle spasm is a chronic issue on the body, but also leading to lack of oxygenation and lymphatic movement. We see that over and over again. So again, for me, it's taking a step back and really looking at the patient as a whole. So. If you're gonna go through chelation, detoxification, all of that, that's impossible to do when you have active infections going on within your jaw. If you have lack of oxygenation, if you have lack of lymphatic movement. And let me just back up for a second. I have probably done over more than 1200 surgeries within the past six, seven years of removing infections out of the jaw, removing advanced infected root canal. And in every case, everything that I've removed, I've sent it to a pathologist for a complete culture. That's where we get the name of every bacteria, virus, fungus, basically that biofilm colony that I removed. And when we read, when we see these reports, it's quite scary what we're finding. How these patients are dealing with not only these gram positive, gram negative, spirochetes, even parasite eggs I'm removing from the jaw. But remember, all these living organisms basically poop. And that poop we know is this endotoxin. Yeah. So, you know, we've taken thermography from our female patients where they're dealing with breast tumors or breast cancers, and we're able to see these infections in the jaw directly through the lymphatic draining into their breast or that tumor area. So, Wow. Again, wow. the more I learned, the more I learned, the more I saw. And of course, what I'm doing requires, has required thousands of hours of continuing education from surgical courses, radiology courses. I mean, you name it to be able to attain this knowledge. So when patients come to me, they're like, well, I've been seeing this dentist for the past 15 years, and they never told me this stuff that you're seeing on these images. I mean, I really don't know what to say, except that maybe that dentist doesn't have the proper continuing education in that format to be able to raise your awareness on it. Again, yeah, I, well, and you're going, you're going to a, a whole other level, which uh, I'm very curious about. And, and of course, yeah, to know what's residing in somebody's mouth, of course, that would affect their overall health. I mean, we are, as you say, we're finding all these connections between oral health and overall health. But, but the, there's no training in healthcare about it and on the medical side as if it's this unknown orifice, right? That is, that is somehow not linked. It's still, uh, I'm hoping COVID changes that somewhat that people are making this connection better, but to go to the level you are of, of actually culturing everything because it's not the same thing. It is not, a, you know, uh, 
it carries, you know, oh, it's just the, the normal bacteria that's, that's uh, eroded your teeth. Um, so, but this is, this is a hard for patients to understand. So you're basically dealing with people who are, who are at, the, at the end of their rope in terms of their health. And, right. and somebody, somebody can't get to the bottom of it with all of the medical treatments that they throw at them. Correct. And they eventually get to a practitioner or read about how the dental part is so important. And that's when they reach out to me where I should have been their first line of defense, you know? Um, and I mean, I mean, even if you look at our medical modality, you have so many different specialists, even in the medical field, and none of them talk to each other. An ophthalmologist yeah. has no idea what the GI specialist is doing. The GI specialist has no idea about what the gynecologist is doing. You see, they're all into their own world and they don't, and, and it's so hard to, even for them to collaborate together. Now you bring the dental, dental part of it in, into the game. You know, um, I remember I was speaking to a very advanced physician surgeon at Stanford who sent his wife to me and she was suffering from a chronic is a health issue. And we took our scan, we did our thermography and we find these infections in her jaw from an old, old wisdom tooth extraction that was affecting her. Well, this specific surgeon wanted me to first go in as a, you know, remove some of the sample of the infection, send it to the pathologist, confirm what we're finding, then go back and do the surgery. You see, that I understand, that I can, that I can comply with. But when I have all these other doctors that, or other dentists that I speak to and they have no clue about their, what I'm doing, I'm being frowned upon. I'm being called a quack. And it's only when I refer them, send them all the research, if they choose to open it and look at it, then I can have a conversation with them. And this I've been dealing with when 20 years ago, 25 years ago, when I started speaking against mercury fillings up to now. I'm it's, sure. It's, well, it's, I, I actually, I was fortunate enough uh, in the early 80s to find what was then a holistic dentist who took all the, the amalgams out and he did it with, with rubber dams and vacuum and all, all the stuff to protect me and himself because I probably and he, had. And the environment. Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, the environment. Yeah, it's like mercury vapor. And yeah. and years later, I had to do chelation to get that that because, of course, I had had those since I was a teen in my mouth. So you, you um, know, we're kind of uh, getting into the mercury. Remember, mercury toxicity is not just from dental fillings. Um, it's been proven that it could be passed down to you through birth, environment, food. You know, we have clouds of mercury vapor coming over from China to the, to the California coast as we from speak. the from the coal plants, yeah. Correct. And, well, so, and it's also, and that's that's what's going into the plankton, which is working its way up the the fish food chain. Which is why, right. you know, if you eat canned tuna, which I used to love, you know, growing up, um, you know, but but as you get, you know, I know it was probably a lot less back then, but. Um, now the, the idea of it is, you know, the, the larger fish have just absorbed an enormous amount of this mercury. Yeah. So it's not, it's not just I amalgams. It's, it's all sorts of stuff uh, that, that the, well, gets in your system. The bigger the fish, more mercury. Smaller yeah. the fish, like sardines, less mercury. Um, quick question for you. I don't know if you've ever seen any of my la other podcasts or my lectures. Do you know who owns the patents? on mercury fillings? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> American Dental Association. Oh, nice. <laughs> in, conjunction, in conjunction with the FDA. Now, let me just take this a little further for you. If you look at the patent law, it is described as a device that is used outside of the body. Now, 
This question <laughs> drove me crazy for years. How is that possible? So what the ADA is saying that your teeth are not a part of your body? Then I want you to put mercury in them, I guess. <laughs> so, now, yeah. I was at a lecture I was giving in uh, Brazil. Of course, after a few drinks with a bunch of my good friends out there that I had met, it came to me how they got away with this. As you know, enamel, remember mesoderm, ectoderm? Yeah. The, the beginning cells of our creation. Mesoderms are what also you get from uh, nails and skin and enamel. That's how they got away with it. Because yeah. enamel is a deri deri derivative of mesoderm, that's how their lobbyists were able to get away with this. Pretty interesting. It's pretty wild, yeah. It well, is. it explains why they, they are still very supportive uh, and will never come out against amalgams. Um, you know, so. sir, and I've said this so many of my lectures, you know, I don't need to see any research. I don't need to be convinced. Above and beyond the fact that Sweden, Belgium, all these European countries banned mercury out of their dental armamentarium around early 90s, above and beyond this and their research, if you look at the periodic table, number one most toxic substance on our earth is plutonium. And what do we do with plutonium? We make atomic bombs with. Second is mercury. So how could any amount of mercury be safe? Again, I don't need to be convinced. I don't need to see any research. If you got the most second, the second most toxic substance in your body, you got to get it out and the source of it. That's what I'm saying. Very simple. At least we got people to stop making hats with it. Um, but, you know, uh, but even then, but think about that. Even then, you know, uh, they were, we didn't stop using it as a substance. Um, so, uh, so uh, I, I, one of the things I, I want to ask this before I forget, because we're talking about materials. Um, do you see us getting to a point where there will be, a bioidentical alternative to to what we're using now, composites and, and uh, porcelain and things like that? Soon, but not soon enough. Um, I know that a lot of European countries are working on glass-like materials. And I think that's going to be the next evolution in, uh, in, in our materials as a, as a restorative material. But unfortunately, up to this point, as I said earlier in my in this podcast, there is no other, there is no material out there that's hundred percent compatible with that body. What we want to do, we want to try to stay away from materials that have a lot of BP in them, methylmethacylate and polymethacylate. If I could take a piece of wood from a tree and kind of put that as a filling, yes, that would be hundred percent biocompatible. Now, I, I've had a number of patients where we actually were able to use diamonds and precious stones as a filling material, very small cavities, not big cavities, but patients who are in need of bigger fillings, and of course, that's costly using precious diamonds, but using composite material, crown materials that we have, it's pretty challenging. One especially when it comes to crown partial dentures, you know, 70% of our laboratories out here, the dentists don't even know it. Those cases overnight get sent to Korea, Taiwan, and Philippines, and they're getting done there with very poor materials. The laboratories that are still in the States, and there's not that many of them that are still operating, are, are, are pricey, to be honest with you. Sure. So when you have a dentist that's only getting, let's say, $750 or $800 from an insurance from that crown that they're placing, of course, they want to keep their overhead down. They're going to go with the least expensive materials possible. Whenever I give it, I give it let's say when I do a crown for my patients, I always give them an option. Just like the way you can drive a Pinto, a Toyota, a Volvo, and Mercedes, there are different laboratories, different protocols, 
and different materials. So it's not up to me to decide what you can afford and what your lifestyle allows you to have. Is basically you have to make that decision. Of course, better material, better lab. For example, I work with a laboratory in, uh, in Los Angeles and I've been working with them for many years now. Whenever I deliver one of their crowns, I'm talking about perfect margins. I don't even have to make a single adjustment. Good material, if you walk into this laboratory, it's spotless. That's how clean this laboratory is run. Of course, a single zirconia implant, my cost is about $750 for that crown. But again, that, that, that's our Mercedes crown, you know? Sure. So it's, you know, when you're talking about biomaterials, it's a whole different world. Of course, we get patients that come in with certain tests that are derived from their blood. So we get this, and I, and I don't want to mention any names of the companies. The pamphlet is about this thick. And you have all these materials that is yes, no, and maybe. Now you have to understand that you have a patient that is pretty toxic, heavy metals, bacteria, what have you. So that tells me that their blood is pretty toxic. So what we've seen, for example, patient wants to get their mercury fillings out. They get this test done and this test tells us what materials to use. They go ahead and use that material. Now, as this patient goes through chelation detoxification, their body wants a complete different material because their blood was so toxic at the time they had these tests done. You see that now? So yeah. again, I mean, I've it's had- complicated, patients, yeah. Yes, I've had patients that are so autoimmune compromised that I actually had to put them on proper biological type, more cleaner type temporary material, let them go through chelation and detoxification and then in two years, when they come back, then we place the right restorative material for them. Again, that becomes a challenge because I got to make sure now my temporary material are good, are sealed. You know, I have to check on them every few months. So again, that becomes a, not a challenge, but some extra work, a commitment basically. So, uh, Let's let's uh, give me one of your uh, most interesting uh, patients that you've you've saw that came to you and uh, without violating their HIPAA necessarily. Uh, to be honest with you, sir, all my patients are really interesting individuals. If they have chosen to take time off from their state, fly down to see me, that that not only I feel blessed but also they know that I will go above and beyond for them. Um, I am dealing with 90% of my patients are dealing with some sort of a healing crisis, some sort of a chronic issue on their immune system. And the dental part is the huge contributor to their wellness. So it's not just one patient, I can tell you, pretty much every single patient of mine is, is going through some sort of a healing crisis. My most challenging, I'll be honest with you, my most challenging is the psyche part of that patient. Hmm. Yeah. That is the most challenging. Some of these patients, and, I, and my heart goes out to them, have been so sick for so long that mentally, they are dealing with depression, anxiety, fear, anger. That is the biggest challenge for me. And of course, I'm not a therapist, I'm not a psychologist, but by the time these patients get, get to me, they've been to five, 10, 12, 15 different types of dentists. And when I hear their stories, you know, for example, I've never had a cavity in my, in my mouth, not even a single filling. Why do I need root canal suddenly on tooth number 18 and 19? Okay. And of course, it's because they were in pain, the doctor jumped into it, did a root canal for them, and now they start a whole different ripple effect where those teeth, the reason for root canal was their clenching and grinding. 
And the mm. time they went to the dentist, the tooth was inflamed, but the vital was a, a vitality test was not done on those teeth. So just because they were in pain, they want to get out of pain. Oh, you need a root canal. Boom, root canal, root canal. Two thousand dollars for each tooth. So that's four thousand dollars right there. Another two thousand dollars for each tooth for crown. So before you know it, they spend about six, seven, eight thousand dollars on these two teeth, and now they're having tooth pain in the other teeth because the common denominator was the clenching and the grinding. You see again, it's about stepping back and really see, number one, we, I wanna put a stop to that vicious paradigm by putting the patient right away on a proper appliance, refer to them to the proper, even a chiropractor to help me. So, I mean, I have my own protocol when it comes to this stuff, but this is what I'm seeing with most of our patients. Going back to your question, the, psych, the psyche issue. That's number one. These patients are just exhausted. They worn out. Psychologically. Yeah, and, and yeah, they're frustrated. They're desperate. Uh, as, anger I could see happening just be, and, and they've just been uh, uh, abused. It would be one word by, by a system that, that bounces them around with everybody's vertical that they, that they're going to see it in. It's, you know, it's that, uh, you know, to to a carpenter every every you know every nail looks like you know needs a hammer kind of thing right so uh you know uh how does how does I, i've seen you do some interesting things you'll you'll even start as simply as as the the center line of of the patient um i i always start with structure i always yeah. start with structure um i i i look at their cranium harmony see where their eyes, where their ears, shoulders, and hip pad, because you know, the, the, the bite really controls this cranium. So I always yeah. start with structure first. Um, and of course with structure comes vitality, tensile strength, oxygenation, and lymphatic movement. How could I expect my patient to get well when there is no lymphatic movement? There is no cranial pulse. You know, especially when I'm doing surgery, if there's no lymphatic movement, how could that area get drained properly? You know, if there's no oxygenation, how could that patient heal properly? So this is where I always start with is always structure, structure, structure. Um, I met a dentist years ago in Washington, D.C., an orthodontist who was treating Down syndrome kids. Mm, wow. I started crying when I saw some of the videos and some of the research that he had released. I, I was just amazed what he taught me in reference to cranial harmony as it relates to hormone production, blood flow to the head and neck, dumping of toxins out. I mean, he was one of my best instructors ever. You know, imagine an orthodontist dealing with helping Down syndrome kids and getting these kids to a point that it, they were able to become a functional part of our society. That is amazing. Well, I, you know, it, it leads to this understanding that that severe malocclusion is a is a full body disorder. It's Correct. not it, it's not a bite problem. And, and, and they and, and they would, you know, even in Down syndrome, they would disconnect it and say, oh, well, well, of course, he has all of these conditions. He has Downs. And you say, yeah, but if his teeth were straight, some of these things wouldn't exist anymore. If he was able to breathe. Yes. It was breathe because, you know, most Down syndrome because they stick their tongue out because they don't have enough room in their oral cavity to breathe, to swallow properly, you know? So yeah. again, there you go. I, I, I love the fact that you can see that. Um, so, you know, I, I think in dentistry, we have, we have a ways to go. Um, through my lectures, of course, I meet all sorts of dentists. Um, you know, I, I meet the female dentist who has a family, you know, as doing dentistry really for her passion, for really for fun in a way. And she's just your average doing fillings, cleanings, what have you, you know? Um, so there's a lot of different type of dentists and their practices out there that I meet. Um, of course, when they look at me and what I'm doing, they kind of, their jaw kind of drops on the floor, their eyes kind of open up. 
um, so I'm always been happy to really share with them the type of work that I do. And I can't tell you how many number of these dentists come to my office and want to just shadow me because I'm showing them a part of dentistry that they have no clue that just they haven't been trained in or learned about. So it's, you know, my father used to say, uh, you know, dental board is not a job. It's an adventure. And that's the way I look at it. It's truly an adventure. Well, and, and I think almost every dentist I've ever met wants to be a healer. Uh, you know, that's why they went into it and, and how they, it's a, it's a difficult job with uh, not a lot of uh, appreciation that comes out of society towards the profession, despite even what normal dental care can do for you. There's, there's isn't enough appreciation in my mind, but I think that dentists are becoming more and more eager to say, okay, how much more can we do? I'd like to see us move in the direction of, of being diagnosticians on a, on a higher level. You know, the, the fact is people see their dentist more than they see their doctor, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and they may go to their doctor and the doctor will, will even do their their annual physical, open their mouth, say, ah, the patient's breath is horrible. And the, the physician doesn't register that as a problem. As uh, as like, yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like this is a third flu this year, but I, I can't understand why it is. So I'm going to give you, you know, uh, so a, a, a Z pack or something. Like All right. That. Well, you know, a lot of that also goes to our insurance companies too. You know, yeah. the HMOs and the PPOs. And so, I mean, that's a whole other world that we can get into is about, you know, I mean, I, I, I refused, I stopped taking insurance around 2006 because I could truly not give my patient best treatment having to work under the umbrella of what I could do, what I couldn't do. So that, you know, that has a lot to do with it also. And, and even... You know, I've been approached by, by, the, by the boards asking me, why do you ask your patient what their blood type is? Why do you ask your patient what their diet is like? Why do you ask your patient if they poop every day? Why do you ask your female patients if, uh, how their cycle is and what they crave or if they have any scars or how many children? I've been frowned upon asking these simple questions. And of course, yeah, which to I, me is medical, your health history, you know, yeah. well, so they're telling me what's that more I'm, important I'm, than, than your, your elimination process and what you ingest every day. Correct. So, so if, for example, if you're not pooping every day, you know, if you're, if when my patient tells me, I, 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 I'm, you know, I have issues, constipation, I, I go to the bathroom once every three, four days. Okay. So I know already there's a liver issue. I know already that they can't dump their toxins. So now I'm going to be introducing anesthetic, all this other, or, or, you know, all this other stuff. So, you know, of course, but the board tells me that I'm acting as a doctor, you know, well, I say, well, doctor of dental surgery. Right. But yeah. No, but you, if you can ask them what medications they take and what they're allergic to and what surgeries they've had on a medical history, why, why would they say, oh, well, that, that you, you can only ask them about those things and, uh, and not 50 other things that relate to their health. Correct. You know, have you had a concussion? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be interesting to know as a dentist, Correct. you know, who's treating their TMJ? Problem. Uh, so, well, uh, you've actually written a book on this at this point. Uh, the, the Good Dentist is the title. Uh, you came out uh, five years ago at this point? Approximately. Uh, That's where I kind of share some of my challenges, a um, little bit about myself, my history, um, more challenges, and a couple of uh, amazing cases that kind of put me on the map. Um, I, I am actually in the process of writing the, uh, part two because so much has changed since the last time I, I wrote this book. So I'm working on that now. Hopefully I'll be able to release that uh, in about a year. Um, but I've got really some really good feedbacks um, from, from, this, from people who have read this book. Of course, there's, there's a lot of books out there on dentistry and holistic dentistry and what have you. Um, so 
I'm not the first one, but again, I wanted to share uh, some of my thoughts. At the end of the day, again, um, I don't care if you're holistic, biological, whatever. I, I just, I just want you to be a conscious dentist. You know, um, I spoke at a symposium a few years ago where uh, two of the biggest uh, so-called biological holistic uh, uh, associations came together. The video is actually is on YouTube. And I was speaking about dental epigenetics. I would love to share this with you one day because you know, you're one of the fathers in dentistry as you know. Um, and uh, it's a very profound lecture. Uh, and, but as I was speaking with these uh, speaking, I, I, I kind of got this feeling that they were not getting what I was talking about. So I stopped the lecture, I asked the 300 dentists, when was the last time they took a course in Adhesive dentistry, not even one person raised their hand. I asked them, when was the last time any of them took a class in restorative dentistry? And these are two basic things that we do. Not even one person raised their hand. That upset me. In order for you to refer your, to yourself as a biological dentist, a holistic dentist, et cetera, et cetera, in my opinion, means that you have mastered all aspects of dentistry in order for you to call you, to give yourself that title. At least that's where I'm coming from. But unfortunately, most of our dentists are learning from their vendors. Mm. See, um, you know, Dr. Bertolotti, one of the most advanced adhesive dentists out there. I truly try to take his courses every two years because the technology is changing so fast. Dr. Picos, an amazing oral surgeon in, in, my, in Florida, has, uh, teaches courses in all aspects of surgery. I try to take one of those courses every two years to update myself with the new findings. We cannot advance as dentist when only classes you're taking about how to get more money from your insurance or, you know, how to run a more successful practice or, you know, how to do better billings or how to do a faster composites, what have you. So this is another part that I'm really concerned with. with. And, and of course, when I give these lectures, like the dental epigenetics, most 99% of the dentists have completely forgotten about the science of what they're doing. They have forgotten about how this engine and everything that goes with it, it's so important and how important the dentistry, how important the dental part of it is. So this is what I see over and over again. So, um, where where does somebody start if they if they if if you've piqued their curiosity to the point where they say all right I I've, I've got to make a deeper dive what's step one and two or course one and two I would say step back into restorative and adhesive dentistry because remember any monkey can remove a mercury filling but an artist is able to rebuild that tooth properly with you know, like for example, one thing we see over and over again, patient had mercury fillings, went to the dentist, mercury was removed, bunch of composite was popped on that tooth. Patient still has pain, discomfort. They get to me, I go through their protocol, I remove that filling and guess what? Underneath it, I see multiple fractures. So every time they biting on that tooth, that fracture is getting elongated. Mm. where simply they could have used the ribbon technique. You know, I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with that technique. This is where we use Kevlar type fibers. Kevlar is what they use for bulletproof vests strategically within our fillings to restore that tooth. It's a whole, not, it's a whole different mentality. So for example, Academy of Biomimetic Dentistry. I'm one of their instructors. I've been involved with them for a long time. That'll be a good start as well. So it's not just about removing that mercury filling. It's also about creating that proper 
tooth with a different format understanding of doing fillings. I also do a lot of in-house lectures. This is where dentists hear my lectures and they invite me to come to their office where I spend two, three days with them. So I work with them more hands-on about biomimetic dentistry. Um, they just don't have the time to travel and take these courses. So that's where I go in the office and really spend patient by patient with them. And some of these dentists, they have gone to a point that they hate restorative. They can't stand it. They don't want to do it. But when I go through it with them, when I do a couple of cases with them and show what they could achieve, they, they, they sort of their heart comes back again. You know, now they love it again. So uh, the, how would they find out about your courses and your and, and some of these in, individual tutoring things for yeah, well, you can word. always they can always email me via my website uh, www.systemicdentist.com or systemicdds.com um, of course okay. due to the covet um, I right before covid I was about to launch a whole series of lectures um and because of COVID, we had to put a stop to that. Um, I do still get invited to lecture here and there, but now that this as, uh, news of possibly COVID-20, COVID-21, and all these more challenges coming our way, I really don't know when I will be uh, back on track again because most of these big symposiums are just basically shut down right now. So we just have to wait and see. But again, I just got back from uh, an office in El Paso, Texas, where I spent three days with a dentist who saw me at a facial aesthetic course in, um, in uh, Fort Lauderdale, um, Florida, that invited me right away within a couple of days. He wanted me in his office uh, for three days. And all I did, I just helped him to restructure some of these old patterns that he had fallen into that he couldn't get up, get out from patients intake form to asking the right directions and basically just treatment planning. Hmm. Fantastic. Well, this is, this is all very interesting. It's exciting to me because I'm always, I'm very into anti-aging and uh, overall health. And I'm, you know, I plan to live to be at least 150 until I can transfer my consciousness to a, a very healthy looking robot. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, this, this is exciting and interesting stuff. And I, and I hope dentists are, are, their interests are peaked as well. And they, they start to pursue this because I think it will make a tremendous difference in healing a, a broader range of patients and, and having patients learn to trust the dentist's opinion and say, look, what's going on in your mouth is critical. It's critical to your whole body. This is the reason you're sick is, is not because you have the flu or something like that. It's because you're constantly inflamed and, and Correct. we can help you with that. So uh, that, that, that right there can get you in trouble as a dentist. I'll because bet. Now, you, now you're acting like a medical doctor as the board, you know, I, I, I have lost my license a long time ago because I can't <laughs> shut up. You uh, do, you do know that there's a, there's gag laws in most of our States. Correct. Yeah. 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 One of those gag laws. Actually, yeah. One of those gag laws, I think it's gag law number 14. It says that a dentist cannot tell you there's mercury in your silver fillings. <laughs> Just putting it out there. Just okay. putting it out there. So again, you know, thank God for the internet. Thank yeah. God for some of my patients are some of the most amazing researchers I've ever met. And I'm, I've learned more from my patients than any course I've taken out there, honestly. So thank God most of our patients that come in, they're aware. They do their research. And when they come to see me, we're almost halfway there. Now, you asked me about an interesting patient, and one just came to me. This young lady is dealing with Lyme disease. And of course, there's a very advanced correlation. I can give you a whole weekend lecture on just Lyme and dentistry. 
she has about eight root canals. So, you know, eight root canals, eight crowns. Each crown, we took images, we did the cone beam, we send the images out to not only a endodontist, but also a, a radiologist. And all her root canals exhibit periapical pathology or lateral pathology or some sort of effrication involvement. So then we send the patient to get thermography done. Are you familiar with thermography? This is where images that look at hot and cold areas of the body. And okay. we can see how multiple of these root canals are hot and draining into our system. Hmm. We also did an oral pathology panel and we found out 99% of what she's dealing with are bacteria, gram positive, gram negative, and spirochetes that are involved in advanced periodontitis. Now, she doesn't have gum disease. She doesn't have periodontitis. We've measured the pockets, looked at images. So she has eight root canals. She is begging me to remove. What do I do with this patient? I can't find it in my heart to remove eight teeth. What do I do? I know that each, of course, I have to send the patient to get consultation from an endodontist, which she has done. The endodontist has advised her to redo at least six of those root canals. She has done her research and she's found that even redoing these root canals doesn't make them 100% sterile. So there's a good chance she could have more problems with them down the line. So she's thinking about financial. So as a conscious dentist, what do I do with this patient? I can't just get in there and remove eight root canals and eventually then put her on a partial later or implants or what have you. You know, that makes it very challenging. So that's why I have to do my research diligently, talk to different specialists diligently, make sure the patient understands everything, all the report, all the consultation, and help the patient to make the right decision themselves. I can't make that decision for them. Even though she's begging me to remove all those eight root canals. I'm like, how are you gonna eat afterwards? You know, this, this is a big step, you see? Yeah. So those yeah. become quite challenging for someone like me who has gone above and beyond the call of duty. I want to make sure at the end of the day, even if my patient chooses to have all the root canals removed, I want to make sure they don't come back to me in two years and say, hey, by the way, Dr. Panapur, uh, you never talked to me about retreatment. That was one of my options, you see? So again, some of these patients are spending a lot of money on just diagnostics and consultations and imaging. Yeah, sure. At the end of the day, the patient has to make that right choice. Well, I want to thank you for your time and the exciting work that you're doing. Uh, and uh, I'm going to have all of this, uh, these connections for you that in the show notes, people. So if you're, if you want to learn more about, uh, biomimetics and systemic dentistry and uh, get started on, on this path and start to transform how you can treat certain patients. It's all going to be there. Uh, Dr. Panapur, thank you very much for your time. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in person out there. I've, I've attended one of your courses and it fascinated me. And so that's why I had to get you on the, on the show. Not that I understood most of it, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. If I could ever be of any future service, if you want just a uh, lecture on just for biomimetics or root canals or any or structural dentistry, you know, I'm a talker, I'm an instructor. I would love to uh, share more of my experience and, uh, and, and research with you. Terrific. Thank you. All right, everyone. Uh, this, as you know, this is a podcast that it benefits by you subscribing to it and sharing it. Uh, so if you liked it, pass it around. Uh, if you didn't like it, pass it around. Uh, anyway, uh, then uh, thank you for listening. Uh, and thank you, Dr. Panapur, for being uh, a remarkable dentist. And for everybody else out there, keep being remarkable. 
Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.